I, I went to York University in the film program. I started in 1970, graduated in 73. And at that time in, in Toronto, um, there was a lot of documentary work. In the feature film side, there was, there was a, an IATSE world, a union world. That, it, at, and literally the, the, the weekend that I graduated, there was a big Warner Brothers sequel to Summer of 42 called Class of 44. And that was shooting, uh, a Warner Brothers movie shooting at U of T, playing as Harvard or some US campus. So that was the movie. While I was in film school, they shot a film called The Paper Chase. In 1970, 71, 72, The Godfather, The French Connection, those were the powerful films that structured how I saw filmmaking and lighting and wanted to emulate Gordon Willis. I mean, everybody did. And suddenly, he's shooting in Toronto and he's shooting in the, uh, the, this big mansion. And a friend of mine lived in the basement of that mansion. So we literally went and kind of eavesdropped this big union show watching Gordon Willis light and shoot the, the paper chase with Timothy Bottoms and uh, John Houseman, all these. It was, so it was like this was the first something that I could touch uh, that was big and cinematic. I had started in 1955 as a, as a kid, literally a five-year-old, with a film strip projector and learning how to, to project. In fact, I was told, you got, you could, here's how to thread the projector, but don't plug it in because you might electrocute yourself. Good advice. So I, I thread it all up. It, it was a film strip called Joseph and His Coat of Many Colors. It was my Sunday school class. And I look in it, and it was upside down and backwards. And I thought, oh, man, I've blown it. First gig, and I, oh. So I take it all apart and rethread it. So it's right side up and frontwards. And I look in, and the Sunday school teacher comes in and plugs it in and projects it on the screen. And it's upside down and backwards on the screen. Now what have I done? So that, I learned right away that things aren't what they seem. All through public school, high school, and university, I was a projectionist. That was my eye into the world. Because there was no videotape. You couldn't, oh, I'll rent this, I'll go to Netflix. I got to see movies four or five times. I'd project a Bergman film, The Seventh Seal, for the, uh, the uh, theater club in Port Credit. And they would have a screening, and they would leave. OK, I'll look at it again. Tomorrow night, so I'd, I'd study them, because that's what interested me. The whole big world out there, all my friends are going hiking, canoeing, and sailing, and I'm in a dark room watching the screen. So that's what interested me. So by the time I got out of film school, I had learned enough to know, in some ways, learned en enough to know nothing in terms of making films on a grander scale. I graduated in 1973 on a Saturday. The Monday morning, I got my first job, and it wasn't on Class of 44, a big union film. It was on a porno called Diary of a Sinner. The film business in Toronto in those days was wide open. One of the filmmakers I hooked up with, the, the, the porno director, was a draft dodger from, from Whittier, California. His name was Ed Hunt. And this is kind of this, this, this spot of, of where the, the virus began and spread. So a lot of us hooked up on Diary of a Sinner, who are now big name producers, David Coatsworth among them. Uh, Jock Brandis was my gaffer. A lot of the guys that I went through the business in Canada, we all started with Ed. My first legitimate feature was called Starship Invasion in 1976, three years out of film school. I met a producer after that called Peter O'Brien, who has since gone on to establish the Canadian Film Institute. I think that's the name. It's got a fancier name, I'm sure, but it's the Canadian version of the AFI. And he had a movie about wrestling called Blood and Guts. A kind of an exploitation film, but these were what I happily called market movies. We weren't doing David Lean and Ingmar Bergman. This was strictly market movies. So a year later, Peter had another movie about drag racing called Fast Company, and he wanted me to meet the director. And I met him, the, the different director from Blood and Guts. So I met David Cronenberg, and to rewind to film school, I, I everyone in my era of that generation had studied David Cronenberg. He was a filmmaker by the, in the purest sense. He, he wrote, directed, shot, edited, kind of created these films. And the, the seminal films for him were Stereo and Crimes of the Future. Very austere, black and white. One of them was black and white, the other one was color, and shot in a very stark way. Uh, and it really was moving to see an English filmmaker who was doing what Jean-Claude Labrec and Michel Bro and a lot of National Film Board guys, these guys I'd study all alone rewinding film, uh, 
this was now a statement coming out of English Canada. It was really great. So I met David, and by then he had done Shivers and Rabid, which were also market movies. So I thought, well, we have something in common. Peter O'Brien said, you guys should get together. And as parallel careers travel in the same direction, he was evolving, so was I. And having done similar exploitation films, shooting a drag race movie from the AIP tradition, that was out of the box, that was great. So David and I kind of bonded. This was in line with uh, Shivers and Rabbit in, in the broad market sense, but Stereo and Crimes of the Future was still in the back of both of our minds. Videodrome was, was kind of a breakthrough for David from the steps we had taken together from Fast Company, which was a market movie, The Brood and a kind of internal introspective thing. Scanners got to be a much broader thing, and Videodrome was taking uh, not necessarily a stab in the dark, but an educated guess to the future and the future of society as well as uh, what we now see as cyberspace. Okay, here we go. This is it. <laughs> Toronto had been fortunate to have two things. Moses Neimer was one of them, who was a wonder boy at CBC who stepped away and started his own television network that wasn't a network. It was called City TV. Toronto was the first city in the world to be completely wired. And he made City TV work for the city itself. And Zneimer was a real clever guy, but he, would, he had another side to himself, which was City TV had something called the, the Baby Blue Movie that, that showed up, I believe it was Friday night at 10 o'clock, or certainly was at midnight, and the weekend was somewhat racy programming. And people, it, it was an unexpected plus to that, that people would come from Buffalo, from everywhere, to come to Toronto, to rent a hotel room, to watch the Baby Blue movie on, on City TV. Uh, so David started picking those ideas and saying, well, what about this, what about that? And this visionary guy called Max Wren, who had an idea to up the programming, and got into Snuff TV. And that was the little, going through the keyhole to an alternate world that ended up with Brian Oblivion. So we had the rough and ready world of city TV with the corridors and the people and the marketing, I want to pitch you this, to finding about Snuff TV and expanding on that and then realizing that's part of a bigger thing. And I like the fact that this was uh, down the rabbit hole and we find this huge world that's right next to you. People on the street, that, that dish on the tower, uh, on the roof of something, well really that's getting this signal and it's affecting people's brains. So it had this expanding moral core that said, here's another layer. Instead of an onion being peeled, we're adding more, more layers. And the only time David and I talked about a look, per se, was when I shot The Dead Zone, and he said, make it look like Norman Rockwell shot it. David was really clever in the sense, he hated storyboards, would not allow them. He had a shot list that he, he would kind of keep to himself. What he wanted more than anything was to block a scene uh, with the actors and myself and the script supervisor and nobody else. And he was very firm about that. Everyone go have Minecraft service, go away. I want silence, I want... So this was now the crucible for what's written and what the actors can provide to see what more they can provide. And, or, and for that matter, improvise. So when it came to a look, a lot of it would come out of... Certainly when you end up in a location, there's only so many places you can put lights and put the camera and it falls into, here's the desk, here's the thing, okay, well, I sit there. The next step he came to was putting a polish on something. Well, let's try pushing in, or let's try it slightly off-center. Anything like that, 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 that would be the Cronenberg touch. I don't think there was an a, overbearing rule. In other words, if you see Bertolucci's films, it's the Raro shot, The Conformist and uh, Last Tango in Paris, you'll see this overt style that's, okay, we got it, this is his style. And David wasn't like that. Scanners look different than the brood. The brood looked different than the fly. The story kind of told the audience this is what it's going to look like. But when it got to Max's apartment, I kind of made a bet with myself and with my gaffer, who had been the DP, uh, DOP on the sh first porno I ever did, and we became partners ever since. His name was Jock Brandis. And he, he would, I would bet each other, I can light this, in this scene in, with three lights. And less than 40 amps, you know, it just got insane. So we got to his apartment and we thought, well, this is different. And Carol had made it this kind of dark, not gunmetal gray, it was kind of dove gray that was 
and I wanted to play with that because it was almost 18% gray. So now we had skin tone and that, the same tone. I wanted to play around with more shadows and traditionally till then I'd been using what I call directional soft light, which is soft cross key and backlight and not a lot of fill. I thought, I'm gonna try to light this Hollywood, old Hollywood style with hard light. And so my gaffer and I would bet each other how this would work. And it did work and it didn't work. So I tried to give Max's apartment a much different feel. A lot of hard slats through the window and cross key light that came out of a lamp. And there were things that we had to deal with differently. When, for example, he's sitting on the couch and he starts scratching his stomach and then he gets into the video drum slit. That was then him standing, we were on a stage, standing with the prosthetic chest and, and legs and the couch kind of came around him so he could put his hand in what was otherwise a false stomach. We wanted to give that a different feel, but vi uh, what is it, vinyl and all kinds of different latex effects, when you apply it to what's otherwise an organism, and now this becomes rubber with hair attached, will look differently. And so applying different light to that, that was the only time we got, we kind of erred away from that. But the scenes with Debbie Harry and Jimmy were very, crafted in, in trying to get this old Hollywood style. And, and in this sense, project more shadows. It wasn't like, this is lighter, that's darker. This is black. I want the side of his face to be black. And Debbie, just a note, this may mean nothing to the audience about Videodrome, but Debbie Harry always had an interesting face. And when she was with Blondie, and she was and still is a beautiful woman, but as a, from a phot photographic standpoint, she had a challenge, shall we say, and had these two interesting lines, call them what you will, it was a challenge. The go-to challenge solution for people is soft light. Another umbrella, another umbrella. I could not get rid of these folds in her cheeks. So we got into Max Wren's apartment set, hard key light, I thought, well, we'll see if I can, they went away. Nicky, don't. Hard light got rid of these, these wrinkles. I couldn't believe it. And then I did the math and I realized if you light someone from here to here and here to here, all with soft light, you're casting an equal amount of illumination and there's no, no way that it, it can unfold itself, basically. It's always gonna create the same amount of shadow. If you have one single source, that will eliminate one specific thing. When he starts uh, engaging the, the Debbie Harry's lips on the TV, you know, that got into that, another challenge. This TV was brown Naga hide. We call it Naga hide. It was vinyl of some sort. My gaffer, Scotty Allen, said, it looks like, like my 65 Mustang. And that's what it was. It was just rubber and it had bladders in it that breathed. So we had to light it and then the actor at a different level. The actor at 16 percent, uh, 18% gray needed far less light than this did, and then her face needed much less light than Jimmy because it was backlit. So it became somewhat of a science experiment to make something look normal and be radically different in, in its uh, proportions in terms of illumination. Oh my God! <laughs> Makeup and effects was very difficult on Videodrome, primarily because skin and, and latex don't absorb and then reflect light in the same way. And my gaffer and I came up with, uh, and as uh, real people are, even with hair and makeup on the set, your body creates oil. It's just part of us being an organism. Latex won't do that. So we convinced makeup and uh, the effects guys to, uh, Stefan Dupuis, I think, did it, to put a light sheen of, of oil, because latex and oil don't combine very well. Sometimes we'd use water. Then the reflectance was the same. The battle for the mind of North America will be fought in the video arena, the video drum. Shooting the monitors was a real challenge. In those days, everything was standard progressive scan. It was uh, NTSC. The monitors weren't very high tech. The computer monitors were very rudimentary. There was the, the bad kind of green graphics and you could see all the noise and everything, which was kind of the appeal. But when it came to shooting TV sets, I'd had a lot of trouble with basically black boxes that would take a signal from the monitor and then run the camera. And the camera would create its own frame rate based on what the monitor was feeding. So we, went, we had a special camera, which was a, called a Panaflex X. 
and it was the bare bones Panavision camera that was a miniaturized Mitchell that had a viewfinder, and that was that. There was no, no rotations of the viewfinder. A lot of tricks weren't there, but it had the ability to go to what was called a TV shutter, 144 degrees. And if you've ever seen a kinescope of the Ed Sullivan Show or older TV projects that didn't record on, on videotape, they were recorded literally on a camera that sh shot a TV monitor, with, and that camera had a TV shutter. We took the same technology from the 40s and 50s into the 80s and said, let's shoot these monitors the same way. <laughs> Samurai Dreams was quite an awakening, but we shot it at a place called CFTO in Toronto, which is out in the suburbs in, in Asian Court. And this was the flagship, um, I guess, studio or, for CTV. That was the first one, and then it grew, and that was their headquarters. And, uh, so we shot it, we, it was shot on, not only in video, but it was shot with two inch Plumicon uh, cameras, a quad, a quad color cameras. So Glenn Warren was the production company and we built this set and shot it with their cameras, two or three camera style. It was supposed to be a Japanese soap opera that was slightly racy. So now we're at CFTO, which is out in the suburbs and these guys never really went downtown much. And it was one of those things where these feeds went all over the, the, the studio. It wasn't just our little room. Because there's quality control, there's the technical director, lighting director, who knows how many people watching it. But one by one, when, when it rolled and this kimono comes off and things started happening, more and more people were, wow, they'd be looking in the studio and look around. There were three people, now there's 30. What are they doing here? They'd never seen anything like that. It was hilarious watching these, these blue-eyed, blonde-haired guys from Scarborough getting freaked out in this scene. To us, it was totally normal, like what? But we were crazy, that was even, I believe, that was ACFC, that was a union show, a Canadian union show, but it was essentially hippie filmmakers up against the establishment and they could not believe it. Videodrome didn't have an ending because David was kind of, from our perspective, was not just feeling his way through it, he was creating it on the run. It's kind of the old joke of, jumping out of an airplane and, and inventing the parachute on the way down, you know, he was kind of doing that on the, literally on the fly. So the last day of shooting, the producer said, we don't know how this movie ends because it's your, your mind, you're doing a great job, but today the money runs out. So when you finish shooting today, this is the last day. So, and my memory being what it is and having been there, I don't, I'm gonna paraphrase myself. We're in the uh, church of the video cameras and so on, video monitors which was the sock factory on, uh, uh, in Toronto. And here's the pages, here's the blocking, let's light it, let's get the crane, and cut! Cut, what's going on? Uh, it's not working, it's not working. Okay, well, should we relight it? No, 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 no. And he, so it rewrites, okay, we gotta twiddle our thumbs for an hour. New pages, exterior alley behind city TV, pack up the trucks, go across town, wet down the alley, smoke, crane, block it all, and cut! Now what? Uh, it's not working, it's not working. Hmm, now it's like seven at night. What, now, new pages. Exterior tugboat down at the harbor, which was the actual end of the movie. And my guy for Jock lived on this tugboat. Let's go to Jock's tugboat. Pack up the trucks, boom, go across town, set up the crane, light it all, and nobody said cut. So he went into the tugboat. Where do we go now? into the hold of the tugboat. What's down there? The flesh TV has another moment, a cathartic moment with this TV. What is the future? And then the TV explodes and, okay, it explodes. <laughs> we finally get almost into this tugboat. And what, what comes out of the TV? Uh, guts, guts everywhere. Well, like, like pig guts? Yeah, where are we gonna get pig guts? Is now three in the morning. And if you know Toronto, Canada Packers. Follow your nose, it's right there at the end of the uh, Gardner Expressway. So they come back with a barrel full of pig guts, put it in the TV and blow it up with an air cannon. So as I recall, that was a 24 hour day. But when the money ran out, that day ended, that was it. We did reshoot the ending, they built a hole that, that uh, we could actually shoot in and redid it. But that was, that was kind of the journey that we would take, it wasn't like, Boy gets, meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl, roll credits. These were journeys that David would take us all on, and it was cool. And, you know, that was when you'd shoot a movie with one Winnebago, 
that was also the, the, the honey wagon, and then two trucks. That was it. So moving around was pretty easy. I don't look nostalgically at that as much as, as I thought I would at the time, but yeah, that was then. David was really following what he felt, what, what was his instinct, and the story could have gone in any number of directions. It's hard to begin a movie like Once Upon a Time, okay, here we go, and then finding a satisfying ending is a, a whole other journey. There's no lines it's, and they all live happily ever after. Well, none of his movies did that, so he had to find a new way to end it. And in the case of Videodrome, Jimmy has been confronted with so many things. His body has been turned into a recipient of flesh guns and flesh cassettes. How are we gonna end this? And so there was a bit of a journey that we talked about as to how to get there. But he con confronted the, the flesh TV, which was the Oracle, his, his portal into essentially his own mind and snuff TV and a whole world of cyber madness. I think what was interesting about the film was that it was a huge breakthrough at that time because video rental houses uh, were kind of new and everybody, certainly in New York, everyone had to see Videodrome. It was like the Seinfeld word of mouth, gotta go get it. And Videodrome was huge from mom and pop rental houses because there was no blockbuster in those days. And that became the, uh, the buzzword. Have you seen video? Oh, you can't believe it. See video, we'll rent it. And to, you missed it in the theater, it was gone, but now it had a whole new life. That was the first time something could, be, could go away and still be around. And I think the, the taste for it, because I talk to people now, oh yeah, I just you did video, bro? And it was like a big point in their life where things stopped and their head explodes, or theoretically explodes, <laughs> not like scanners. And they ended up having their own signpost or, or uh, landmark to say, my life changed because of that. Videodrome is death. I'm very proud of it because it, it, for better or for worse, we now have a cyber world that this really just suggested. And rows and rows of you know, a giant library of VHS tapes now fit in, in you know, 1K of RAM in everyone's phone. It's no big deal. But the, the accepting of the fact that uh, long live the new flesh, meaning a, a digital cyber flesh, we've now replaced knowledge with access to information and saying, I don't know, but I'll Google it. I'm a genius. Well, no, you're not. your phone isn't, your battery's not dead. So, okay, I could do that too. Knowledge, wisdom, uh, information, uh, these things are all conflated. And I think this addressed it even indirectly to say if this, this is what the world is coming to, when they, Brian Oblivion only appears on television, on television, and he's on a talk show and he's, his, the monitor's on the, the little guest chair. I mean, that was a nudge at everything that was plastic about life that had turned into a talk show was now uh, the Brian Linehan version of, uh, I'm gonna probe your mind and ask you about, do you know anyone called Kardashian? You know, really? That's as thick as, this, as, as, thick as this is gonna be. It's pretty, pretty shallow. And David was aware of that. <laughs> Video tape was, there was nothing digital at all. It was really in the dark ages of what is now cyber everything. So we can get information, tell something quite immediately. In those day, and then Snuff TV, uh, Google this and you're watching it. What was otherwise, I heard about this thing and it got it in a giant dish and we could, and turned out, oh, the, the, the evangelical right has decided that inside this thing that'll appeal to that strata of society they don't like is a death ray that will kill them if they watch it. Let's use that. Shades of uh, Dick Cheney, you know, who knows? So it's it all poked fingers at something in different directions that actually came true in different ways. And in terms of morality, what is right? What is wrong? Are we wrong to watch, eight, have 800 channels of TV and, and have a giant internet that 95% of which is for pornography that apparently nobody talks about and the rest is about Hillary Clinton's emails, you know, who cares? In those days, anything could have happened and David kind of suggested it might all happen. To me, society is broken into two, not opposing, but uh, coexisting strata, AM and FM audiences. Beer versus white wine, NASCAR versus Formula One, Michael Bay versus, you know, Bergman. And that's always gonna be the, the, David found his way in between those two. Scanners, all the AM crowd, we love it. And the FM crowd, yeah, it's very clever. 
even more so with Videodrome that just appealed to everybody. Because it had enough sex, it had enough violence, it had enough everything. But it had a really cool story that didn't go beginning, middle, and end. It took you a long way around to get to something that was otherwise intriguing on its own. And I don't think we need to seduce people to con them into thinking, this is an art house movie, you'll love it, or you'll, this is an art house movie, you're going to hate it, don't go and see it. And david he's been on a tightrope a lot with different movies that have had lesser or greatest success by addressing or ignoring the mass audience. Because in the end, people just want to come home and turn on the tube, you know, watch Netflix and eat a bowl of microwave popcorn. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard to, as a filmmaker, because how do you make yourself different? But it's hard to keep repeating yourself. Ask James Cameron, <laughs> when's Avatar 2 coming out? You know, he's afraid of himself. I don't think David is, he's always exploring new things. Mm -hmm.